Each spring, flocks of elegant russet red black tailed godwits arrive in the wetlands of lowland England from their wintering grounds in West Africa. Over 80% of the UK's population of this distinct Limosa subspecies breed at the Ouse and Neen washes. In the 19th century, the Limosa subspecies went extinct in the UK due to habitat loss and anthropogenic pressures ranging from shooting to egg collection. They naturally recolonised in the early 1950s, establishing a small breeding population. Recently, egg and chick predation and increased spring flooding has affected the godwit's ability to successfully raise chicks, causing a dramatic population decline, with extinction in Britain a real possibility. A major element of Project Godwit was to undertake the UK's first trial of head starting. This process removes vulnerable eggs from the wild and rears them in safe, captive environments until the chicks reach fledging age and can be released back into the wild. The project has head started over 200 godwits, resulting in a 40% increase in the British godwit population. This video describes the process of head starting black tail godwits in the fens and the experiences and lessons that the project team have identified as important to their success. A thorough feasibility study, disease risk assessment and captive trial was undertaken before initiating Project Godwit. This film will concentrate on the head starting activities once the project had begun. Every element of Project Godwit that involves interactions with birds, eggs, nests or chicks was strictly controlled by licenses granted and monitored by Natural England. Preparations for a season of head starting begin in January, with staff recruitment, ordering of supplies, renting facilities, formalising licensing agreements and planning timelines for the year ahead. In March, preparations for the arrival of the first eggs begin with the delivery of a porter cabin that will become a biosecure facility, housing the incubation and early chick rearing rooms. Once delivered, the cabin is deep cleaned and portal entrances are created. These include clean coveralls, changes of footwear, disinfectant mats, hand sanitizer and sterilizing wipes. Biosecurity and cleanliness is a vital aspect of the head starting program and it is important at every stage. Incubation and indoor chick rearing equipment that has been stored over the winter is deep cleaned, disinfected and switched on. It is vital to recalibrate equipment and make sure the incubators will function correctly throughout the season. Air conditioning units in the facility maintain an internal temperature of 19 degrees and a dehumidifier controls humidity levels, which allows the incubators to operate more efficiently. Happy chick brooders are built, disinfected and set up to house chicks. Heat lamps and UV lights are installed and tested. Exposure to UV is essential to aid calcium absorption and bone development in young chicks. Towels, fleeces, Flotex mats and non-slip matting is all cleaned ready to provide the chicks with the correct substrates for sleeping, brooding and learning how to walk. Food bowls, petri dishes, pebbles and plastic Christmas tree branches are prepared to provide chicks with water, food, stimuli and naturalistic shelter. The outside rearing tunnels are inspected for wear and tear and repaired where necessary. The outside rearing arcs are built and the stakes and boards required to build their runs are all placed ready in the tunnels. Vegetation management begins with the aim of providing the chicks with a safe and stimulating rearing environment. 
as the facilities are set up, the strict biosecurity procedures intended to protect and safeguard the eggs and chicks are also implemented. On entry to each biosecure area of the project site, staff and visitors are required to change footwear, sanitise hands, put on clean bespoke coveralls and wipe down any equipment with sterilising wipes. In late March, the Godwits return to the fens to breed and by mid-April have begun to nest. Suitable nests that fit with our licensing and project criteria are identified for egg collection. The vulnerability of these nests to predation means that the team must act fast. As soon as a clutch is complete, normally four eggs in total, the eggs are collected from the nest. Wearing gloves, the eggs are carefully examined for any cracks or perforations that could affect hatchability before they are placed into a portable incubator. Powered by a car battery, this incubator maintains a constant temperature of 36 degrees Celsius. We have found that transporting the eggs at a temperature 1.5 degrees cooler than true incubation temperature helps protect the delicate embryos from overheating while being transported over bumpy Fenland roads. On arrival at the incubation facility, the eggs are immediately processed. An indelible marker pen is used to label each egg with a unique identification number. This number shows which clutch the egg came from and the egg's number within the clutch. This allows the origin of birds to be followed throughout the process. Eggs are then weighed and their length and breadth measured. This allows the laying date of the egg to be calculated and provides a baseline for managing egg weight loss during incubation. The aviculturalist will adjust the environmental humidity of each egg to achieve a target weight loss of 15% over the incubation period. Finally, the egg is candled to assess how well the egg has dealt with being transported, whether it is fertile, and to detect any shell cracks that could be repaired with clear nail varnish. The eggs are closely monitored throughout the approximately 24-day incubation period. The incubators are checked every three hours during the working day and every six hours throughout the night to ensure that they are maintaining a temperature of 37.5 degrees and the specific relative humidity set for each incubator. After every visit, the surfaces are wiped down and floors are cleaned. At the same time each morning, the eggs are weighed. Eggs are normally incubated at 50% relative humidity. Eggs that are not losing weight quickly enough are moved to a dry incubator at 30% relative humidity. If losing weight too quickly, they are moved to a wet incubator at 70% relative humidity. The project uses Brinsey and Hemel incubators that automatically rock the eggs every hour. In addition, the eggs are turned manually every 12 hours, an action that is essential for correct embryo development. Every two days, the eggs are candled to monitor embryo development and if necessary, egg management is adjusted. We found that struggling embryos benefited from more manual turning. Any egg with reduced vein development was manually turned five times a day as this helped to improve the distribution and development of the veins. Approximately 18 days after laying, the chicks will begin to internally pip. At this point, to aid hatching, the eggs are moved to a pre-hatching environment where the humidity is raised to at least 70% and all egg turning stops. Godwit hatching can take 92 hours. Patience is necessary among the expectant aviculturalists. We have learned that wading birds have extended hatching periods and it is necessary for them to undertake the process unaided, both to encourage full yolk sap absorption and reduce the risk of edema, water retention in the legs. 
when the chick has progressed well with hatching is moved to a hatcher at a cooler temperature of 35 degrees and a high humidity. If all goes well, the chick will hatch in this environment and remain there for about two hours to allow full yolk sac absorption. A wet weight is taken for the chick and identifying plastic rings are added to its legs before placing it in a dryer for between 12 and 20 hours. This dry environment dries out the chicks down. Once hatchlings become active, broods of chicks are moved together to a happy chick brooder in the adjacent room. The chicks are provided with a variety of substrates on which they learn to use their enormous feet to navigate the world. Chicks will fall when learning to walk, so it's necessary to remove as many trip hazards from the environment as possible. Godwit chicks often hatch with slightly curled toes. In most cases they will straighten out within 24 hours. If not, we have found they are easily corrected with the use of a simple splint. The chicks are closely monitored as they learn to eat the food provided and weigh daily to monitor and control weight gain. Food and supplements are presented in a variety of ways. Petri dishes, which have been made slip-proof by the addition of non-slip matting, are filled with water and floating Lundy Micro 35% protein pellets. Insectivorous feast is sprinkled on the floor and around the dishes and small live crickets are added to encourage the chicks to hunt. Godwits grow fast and develop quickly. By three days old, the majority of chicks are being fed Lundy Micro, a lower protein concentration of 20%. This reduces the risk of problems with leg development, an important issue when rearing long-legged birds. Once the chicks are eating dry Lundy pellet, we move them outside as soon as possible. This depends on favourable weather conditions, but we aim to get the birds outside by day four with a maximum of day seven. Outside, the chicks are safe from predation in a biosecure tunnel with a double layer of mesh buried in metal sheeting and electric fences. Provided with an arc for shelter, a lamp for warmth and a small grass run built with stock board and stakes, the chicks are able to express natural behaviours as they chase and hunt spiders and flies in their new wetland home. The outside environment is soft and all trip hazards have been removed. Each day the runs are extended and the chicks are given access to larger and deeper water bodies. Eventually broods are mixed and given access to the entire tunnel. Exercise is key to strong development. An overweight godwit will quickly develop leg problems and that may mean it cannot be released. Throughout the rearing process it's important to steadily progress the chicks through the rearing stages. The chicks have their food and water routinely refreshed throughout the daylight hours, but will steadily have human contact reduced as the chicks grow and become wilder. A vital tool in assessing the success of the project is being able to track individuals post-release. Between 16 and 22 days old, the birds are caught for ringing. BTO qualified bird ringers under special methods licenses collect biometrics and fit the chicks with their adult rings. All chicks receive a unique set of four colour rings, a BTO metal ring and a pit tag. A selection of birds were also tagged with geolocators and radio transmitters. All of these methods help provide information on the bird's survival, local movements and migration. 
As the birds mature, their feather development is rapid and they soon begin to attempt flight. At this point, the birds are ready to be moved to the release aviary. Before they are transferred, the birds have a full health assessment and samples are taken to test for the presence of a number of avian diseases. Feathers are also collected to allow for DNA sexing of each bird. Birds are then individually placed in cardboard boxes and transported to the release aviary, where they stay for up to a week to prepare them for release. Far away from human activity on the wetland itself, this aviary provides the birds with an ideal environment to acclimatise to the wild. For birds released through the softer method, no artificial food is provided on the day of release. The door to the release aviary is removed and the staff stand back, watch and wait. Sometimes the birds will fly straight out of the aviary. On other occasions, it can take a couple of hours for birds to leave. Patience is key and the release aviary must be observed throughout. As per our licensing requirements, we also undertook a more direct release method, where birds are transported in cardboard boxes to the release site. Accompanied by a vet, the birds are unboxed and placed in a temporary corral made of stock boards. This allows for a final health check to make sure they have travelled well. After approximately 10 minutes, the stockboard corral is opened and the birds are able to walk out onto the washes. Due to the logistical and possible welfare implications of the direct release method, we would suggest using the softer method for future Godwit releases. Monitoring of birds post-release is essential to measure the effectiveness of head starting. Immediately post-release, the team needed to know how the head-started chicks behaved. Observations showed that head-started chicks fed, moved and behaved normally, often associating with wild-reared goblets. Sightings along the flyway and the use of geolocators showed that head-started individuals followed the same distribution and migration patterns as wild-reared birds, and subsequently returned to their release sites, paired up and bred. The project has achieved its goal of bolstering the Fen Godwit population with fit, well-adjusted and behaviourally normal head-started Godwits. Project Godwit has demonstrated that head-starting is a useful tool in boosting a population of black-tailed Godwits and the technique has had a positive impact on the UK breeding population. Head starting, however, is not a long-term solution. It provides a short-term boost and must be part of a wider, long-term conservation programme. Protecting and restoring their wetland habitats remains the number one priority. Head starting is a tool we can now use alongside those efforts to return birds to restored habitat or maintain a population while threats are being addressed. <laughs>